Sarge J. Scanlon from the FDLE who will speak, and we also have State Attorney Bill Gladson who will speak. If you need spellings on any of those names, I can get those for you before you leave. Sure. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you again for coming. Uh, we have uh, a case that we've been working for a couple weeks. It's uh, obviously not near as long-term or as complicated as uh, yesterday's Jennifer Odom case, but nonetheless, I think it's similar in some ways of a, uh, an adult male uh, being uh, violent and trying to take advantage of young females. Um, this particular individual, uh, really uh, had some creative ways to uh, abuse women and I think you'll find it fairly interesting as we go through it. Now <clears throat> I'm going to start off by telling you it's going to be a little confusing because obviously we want to be cautious not to give any information that could divulge the identity of any victim. So there are going to be two victims in this case. Uh, I'm going to call victim number one just because chronologically she met the suspect first. She is a at now, she is a young adult. Um, I've been told by investigators she's very naive, but she is an adult, barely. Um, and she's victim number one. Victim number two is absolutely a juvenile. Also with some, uh, maybe some challenges that may make her uh, mental age a little lower than her chronological age, but even chronologically, she is definitely a, a juvenile. She has not reached 18 yet. So those are the two victims we're talking about and a suspect. So everything will revolve around those three individuals, uh, at least initially, and we may talk about some other victims later. But uh, on Monday afternoon, July 10th, uh, we received a call from the, or a teletype from the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office to our south, a, a few hours south driving time. And they gave us information about a, a potential location for a runaway juvenile. Uh, we get those every day and we go out and try to recover those juveniles. So that in and of itself was not unusual. But we went to the 5,000 uh, block of uh, Pinehurst Drive in Spring Hill and we found the suspect and his name is Peter, or James rather, Peter Hulis. He's a 56 year old white male. I'll talk a little bit more about him in a moment, but uh, and we're also gonna ask for the public's help when it comes to him as well. Uh, in addition to the suspect, we found a young uh, female adult who we're going to call victim number one, <clears throat> as well as the missing juvenile from Charlotte County who we're going to call victim number two. We did not at the time really have any indication that either females were victims of human trafficking. So we went ahead and, um, and recovered the juvenile and the suspect told us that uh, he and victim number one the person uh, who is a young adult, were under the impression that this juvenile, the runaway juvenile, was 18 years of age and was recently kicked out of her residence. And he actually paid to have an Uber driver drive her from Charlotte County to Spring Hill. Now the juvenile victim number two, again the runaway from Charlotte County, was taken to a local runaway shelter here in Hernando County. Uh, waiting for her father to come and respond from Charlotte County the following day. <clears throat> the next day, before her father actually came, she disclosed to both uh, the shelter workers and then shortly thereafter deputies who responded that she met our suspect um, and victim number one on a social media uh, dating type platform. I'm not going to say the name of it. I debated on whether to say the name of it. It's not a common one. I had not heard of it previously and I certainly don't want to give them any advertisement, but it was not a common uh, uh, social media platform that we hear about every day. It was some an, an unusual one apparently for dating type things or um, uh, sexual type things. Um, on the Sunday be, uh, on the Sunday evening, uh, before the victim left home, the juvenile victim, uh, she believed she was discussing sexual activity with the young adult victim number one, the other female in this. So the vi victim from Charlotte County on this app 
was apparently conversing with who she believed to be victim number one. It was decided that the, the female victim, uh, juvenile, would travel to Hernando County and take up residency with our suspect and victim number one. The juvenile also stated she was uh, sent a contract and it was referred to dominant and submissive agreement by email. Now, the female victim, the juvenile, uh, advised she didn't read the contract, but she apparently acknowledged it to our suspect um, and made some sort of agreement to abide by it. Uh, and we'll find out that she w doesn't have the ability to do that, obviously, as a juvenile. But she confirmed that uh, our suspect did send an Uber to pick her up and transported her to his house on July 9th, that Sunday, and she arrived about 10.30 p.m. The juvenile was uh, provided her own bedroom and food, and our suspect and the two victims watched a movie and consumed some marijuana. The three of them eventually moved to our suspect's bedroom uh, where they engaged in sexual activity. The juvenile victim stated that she never intended to engage in sexual activity with Hollis. Again, she thought that this was with the other young adult female victim. And, uh, and this was all based on their previous discussions via this app. Victim number two was made aware that by accepting the terms of the contract, she must perform any sexual act as demanded by the dominant, in this case, our suspect, as uh, she was his submissive. Now we're probably going to provide you with a, co a copy of the content of that. My PIO will send it out later. But uh, the contract stated things like, and this is hard to believe, but uh, this document serves as an agreement which defines in specific terms the relationship and interaction between two individuals hereafter termed the submissive and dominant. The contract went on to advise uh, what was required of both individuals with the dominant agreeing to provide, and I quote, a beautiful home on the ocean and a little bit of a information here, Pinehurst is not anywhere near the ocean, Pinehurst Drive, but, uh, but <clears throat> promised to pay, uh, provide a beautiful home on the ocean, pay for all expenses including food and drinks and all utilities associated with the home. And the submissive was agrees to serve, obey, and please the dominant. The contract stated the submissive will always respond to the sexual needs of the dominant at any time and in any manner he sees fit. And this includes engaging in uh, sexual activities with the dominant that might be outside her comfort zone, but not painful, but she will do them as they please him. Uh, hard to believe, but that's what the document said. The victim described how her suspect uh, conducted sexual acts on her, and the details, of course, are not appropriate for, uh, you know, for TV. The juvenile victim number two described how uh, our suspect forced the young adult victim number one, the one that was there with him when she arrived, uh, to perform, he forced the adult to perform sex acts on the juvenile. Um, and now we're starting to see some evidence that uh, the young adult female was actually starting to become a victim of human trafficking as well. Heretofore, we didn't know that. Uh, Monday, July 10th, whoops, excuse me. On uh, Monday, July 10th, uh, before we became involved, the suspect and the young adult uh, victim, number one, took the juvenile victim to a local department store where our suspect purchased clothing for the juvenile. Um, again, we look at this as, uh, you know, grooming that individual and he, the suspect, regulated control of uh, cell phones by both of our victims, so he was very controlling. <clears throat> On Monday, July 10th, the juvenile victim was able to take several photographs, so this is the Monday after she arrived, including a photograph of our suspect as he sat on the sofa nude with his exposed genitals. Now, FDLE agent uh, Zachary Hughes, who's to my left here on the far, my far left, your far right, he is certified expert in human trafficking 
uh, back in June of 22 by the 13th Judicial Circuit of Florida, which is Hillsborough County, uh, we consulted him. And he was able to provide valuable support for this investigation to include in assistance with not just victim interviews from a perspective of an expert in human trafficking, but also helped us place these victims. And before I go a little bit further on what, what he was charged with, I'll maybe have him come up and, and talk a little bit about his involvement, and then I'll go on a little bit more about what occurred in the investigation. So uh, special agent, or not special agent, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna have our special agent, uh, assistant special agent in charge come up and talk a little bit about FDLE and how they work uh, human trafficking and some of the things that they do. So I'll have you come up and speak a little bit. Thanks, Sheriff. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, State Attorney Bill Glasson. Uh, as I stated earlier, I'm Florida Department of Law Enforcement Assistant Special Agent in Charge, Jay Scanlon. It's my privilege to be here and speak with you about this case and the incredible bravery displayed by the survivors in this case. First, I want to commend the Hernando County Sheriff's Office, their investigative team, the State Attorney's Office, and our FDLE investigative team for their outstanding work on this case. Bringing swift and fair justice is one of our main objectives, and this is achieved in part by fostering partnerships with other law enforcement agencies during multi-jurisdictional investigations like this. I do want to take a moment and focus on the courage and strength of our two survivors. Without their fortitude, the monster in this case, you heard some descriptions from the sheriff uh, about how heinous his mindset was. Uh, he would have had the ability to continue his depraved actions and terrorize additional victims and would not have been brought to justice. This investigation, while disturbing, also highlights the partnerships and services that are in place to rescue and ultimately assist victims with their recovery as survivors. In working with them, we're able to support them with local resources to provide them shelter and recovery from this harrowing experience. It's imperative that when a victim of a human trafficking feels safe enough and can trust those helping them, they gather as much bravery as they can to speak up about what's been happening to them. Resources such as the Florida Human Trafficking Hotline and private uh, non-governmental organizations such as Creative Gainesville are set up to help victims of human trafficking with outreach, inpatient, and outpatient services. If you, knew, if you or someone you know is in danger, please don't hesitate to call the Florida Human Trafficking Hotline. That number is 855-FLA-SAFE or 855-352-7233. Thank you. Appreciate it, Sheriff. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, and again, uh, I got a really... Uh, talk a even a tiny bit more about Special Agent uh, Hughes. Uh, my people said he was uh, instrumental in getting this across the finish line, and I think you'll find out some more information here that uh, not just looking at this as uh, something that was uh, happening between three people that were consenting, which they were not, but uh, obviously these are very difficult situations, and getting people to open up is, is, is difficult at times, and Special Agent Hughes was a huge part of that and he uh, does such a good job I was actually even speaking with the Attorney General a few days ago and she had planned on being here but she was not able to be here but she uh, knew him by name and knew his reputation and, and appreciated the work he does uh, on human trafficking here in the state of Florida so we again thank you for your help on that um, so on Tuesday July 11th we were able to charge the suspect with uh, three counts, unlawful sexual activity with a certain minor, meaning our second victim, unlawful uh, use of a two-way communication device, obviously using the app, and contributing to the delinquency of a minor. But the case obviously did not stop there. On Tuesday, we obtained search warrants for uh, the suspect's residence, as well as a search warrants for collection of DNA from the suspect as well as victim number one again at that point we weren't sure how much of a victim she was uh, and they were executed the suspect and victim number one were interviewed and as the investigation unfolded it became apparent that victim number one was also in fact a victim of human trafficking by our suspect post Miranda our suspect made full admissions to the sexual activity uh, maintaining he believed our juvenile sus our juvenile victim rather to actually be over 18 years of age he provided numerous details consistent with those reported by both victims 
He also admitted to terms of the aforementioned contract providing financial support in return for sex. He confirmed that the contract was sent via his personal email account. And he also mentioned, and this is hard for me to believe, several times during the interview, how fortunate the victim was that he provided for her and that he benefited from the sexual uh, contact as described in the contract. Uh, definitely a, 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 a sick individual to say the least. Uh, young adult victim number one, again the adult in this, made statements consistent with, consistent with the juvenile victim. A very important point, she was not a willing participant. The juvenile thought she was coming to meet the adult female, but the adult female was not a willing participant with the, sec the second victim. She too felt obligated based on the same dominant submissive contract contractual agreement she made with our suspect. And she said when she attempted to refuse his request, he physically forced her to engage in Kalingus with the uh, victim number two. Again, I won't go into a lot of details with that, but he actually physically forced her to engage in a sexual activity with our juvenile victim. So young adult victim number one advised that our suspect physically strangled the juvenile during sexual activity. And because she knew how rough our suspect could be, she actually traded places with the victim to try to keep that victim, the juvenile victim safe. <clears throat> victim number one stated, again, the young adult stated that uh, the suspect was always in control of the conversations on that dating app we were talking about. And at times, often pretending to actually be the young adult female victim, except when a voice call was required. So on Thursday, July 13th, our suspect was charged with uh, sexual battery on the young adult victim, the one who was uh, residing with him at the time uh, that the juvenile showed up. And this led to a no contact order by the judge during first appearance. Over the next three days, our suspect violated the order numerous times. He also instructed victim number one to drop the charges and stop speaking with law enforcement. This resulted in several additional charges of witness tampering in violation of pretrial re release, in other words, contact with the victim. Um, <clears throat> further investigation revealed that while the young adult victim, number one, again, our adult, and the suspect were in the state of Colorado, they actually came here from Colorado, and we'll talk about that a little bit, our suspect arranged for multiple male subjects to engage in sexual activity with her and I believe there might have been some money involved. Is that true? Yeah. So he actually prostituted her out while they were in Colorado. That's what our information is. Uh, and there were two additional suspected, suspected rather, occurrences. And since leaving Colorado, he has lived in Miami and Hollywood and Hudson before coming to Spring Hill. It's also important to note that uh, our suspect met our first victim, the young adult, while they both lived out west in two different states. Uh, and it's most likely, while I'm almost 100% uh, certain she was a juvenile at the time they met, um, <clears throat> and um, they met online, uh, an online dating site, and he lured her to Colorado, groomed her and manipulated her in various ways to isolate her from her family and community. And uh, talking with the special agent before we came in here, he says she is also, even though she is technically an adult, she's also very naive um, and uh, easily uh, manipulated. So uh, because victim number two was less than 18 years of age or is less than 18 years of age, she obviously cannot consent to either a legal or illegal uh, commercial sex act. Therefore, the suspect was actually trafficking uh, the victim in violation of Florida statute. Additionally, the investigation revealed at least two additional adult females who were formally romantically involved with our suspect. Both reported incidents where he was extremely controlling and manipulative. Both of those prior victims filed police reports due to his obsessive and harassing behavior. One resulting in his arrest and subsequent uh, domestic violence injunction in California. So he lived, in addition to Colorado, he lived in California. 
A police report was uh, found in Aurora, Colorado, where the young adult victim number one was the alleged victim of an abduction and sexual battery. The report was inactivated due to some conflicting statements by the victim and her becoming uncooperative with the investigation. It was later learned that our suspect was listed in the report as her father. Her cooperation, or her uh, lack of cooperation rather, in the investigation was obviously at his behest. Now, dated from his cell phone shows numerous attempted contacts with females via online dating sites, and we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. The examination of the information from search warrants executed on his email accounts and social media accounts are still in process, and communication has been established with the Aurora Police Department and Colorado Bureau of Investigation. They will be initiating a human trafficking investigation as well as to what occurred between uh, Hulis and the young adult female victim number one uh, while they were residing in Colorado. Now, before I go into what we're gonna ask our help with from our media partners, I'll turn it over to our state attorney, Bill Gladson, and then I'll also maybe have my uh, detective, uh, Harper, assigned to the case come up and maybe say a few words and answer a few questions. So first, uh, uh, Mr. Gladson, thank, thank you. Sure. Thank you for your cooperation. As I said yesterday, an advocate for victims uh, he is not afraid to go after individuals and send them to prison. We're usually uh, one of the top in the state, even though there are several judicial circuits much larger than ours, but sending people with serious, chronic criminal histories to prison. So we appreciate that because we can't do our job without him. So thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Glatz, and I'm the state attorney for the Fifth Judicial Circuit. And listening to the sheriff give the details about this case i think um, it speaks to why it's so important to educate the public and to make sure to educate the public about human trafficking and to make sure that uh, the detectives are given the tools necessary to identify it when they're doing their investigations and what you see today is a result of initiatives like uh, the attorney general's initiative about human trafficking materializing because as we talk about it more we are able to identify it more. I can, I can say with certainty a case like this could have stopped short with some of the investigation ending up with a couple charges, but when people collaborate and work with other agencies and identify people that are subject matter experts like Zach Hughes, uh, they end up seeing a bigger picture, and that's because of education. So I think it's important, in a, not just for law enforcement, but also for prosecutors and for the public because human trafficking is happening way more than I think any of us realize, so it's, it's, um, it's of paramount importance. So I just want to thank the Sheriff's Office for doing such a good job. It really does make our jobs easier, and uh, the thoughtful, uh, slow, methodic investigation into cases gives us the evidence we need to get the convictions that we need. And that's the most important thing, as you said, in the end, removing bad people from the streets. So uh, thank you very much, okay, Sheriff. Thanks. Yep. Tech, do you want to get up and say a few words? Yeah. <coughs> And if you, any of you have any questions for the detective, feel free. I don't, he's probably not going to be able to say a whole lot more than we said, but yeah, go ahead. Sounds up pretty uh -huh. good. Uh, my name is Detective William Harper. To start off, I want to thank FDLE and specifically uh, Agent Hughes here. Uh, once we received the case, it was obvious this would be something more significant than what was originally reported. Uh, it was probably going to be crossing across county lines and state lines. Um, I was in contact with Agent Hughes, and he was here within the hour to assist in any way possible whatsoever. Um, I would also like to take time to urge uh, parents and young adults to be vigilant on what's occurring online, specifically with juveniles online. Uh, specifically in this case, a uh, young juvenile believed she was talking to one person. In reality, she was talking to a 56-year-old man. Uh, and that's something that she was unaware of. So, like I said, uh, urge parents to be vigilant on what your children are doing online, the juveniles are doing online, and uh, make sure they understand that it's not always what it appears. So, any questions? Can you talk a little bit more about the timeline for when So we were, we were very fortunate uh, in terms of victim number two uh, because of the, as mentioned by the sheriff, the missing juvenile teletype we received. Uh, they were able to locate her via phone and uh, sent us to the house. So we were able to respond to the house uh, in less than 24 hours of her being there 
which was fortunate. So that way we were able to stop any other activity going. Um, I can't be too specific in terms of the other victim. Uh, like I said, it's an ongoing investigation, specifically in Colorado. Uh, but they had been together for over a year, I can say that. And can you tell us their exact ages? Uh, not specifically, no ma'am. And did the investigation lead to him with the father reporting or did his daughter run away? Correct. Yeah. yeah, she was entered as a missing juvenile, and then uh, the agency there sent us a teletype in terms of trying to locate her. And was it pretty easy to just take a number of those Correct. And like I said, they, they were able to locate her via a ping on her phone. Uh, they gave us the address, and when we responded, she was there. What is it about this guy that he was able to have such an influence on, um, especially the one who is you know, over 18? Well, specifically to this case, I can tell you he utilized victim number one to speak with victim number two. There was a relationship built there while they were speaking online, uh, and victim number two was able to start to gain emotions uh, to the other victim, and he ultimately used that to his own benefit. Is there any indication that he's been doing this for a long time, that there could be other... Right. So, investigation's still ongoing. Uh, last thing we want is there to be other victims out there that we have not located. Uh, so we're still going through various things, there's search warrants, uh, going through different data. I can tell you I have spoken to several other individuals involved with them. Um, in terms of human trafficking, as of this point, they were not involved. However, I can tell you from everyone I've talked to, they have described him as being extremely controlling and manipulative uh, in terms of how he treats women. So. Is this document, I know you said that it wasn't legal in this particular case because she was a minor, but is there any circumstances where that is a legal document or is that always a red flag? Well, in terms of, I mean, for charges, so you have human trafficking, obviously there's all kinds of prostitution. So it's for us to determine if the commercial act is occurring. Um, it makes a difference in terms of if it's voluntary or involuntary. Uh, if it's for money, what's occurring? So it all kind of depends on that kind of situation. I can say in terms of this case, um, specifically with victim number two, it was never in reference to the suspect obtaining money. Uh, this was for his own sexual benefit and in exchange he was providing to the victim. Okay. Along with him saying he believed that the victim number two was of age, do you think he was doing anything wrong at all? I can tell you from speaking with him, uh, no. He, he believes he was in the right, as the sheriff mentioned. Uh, he stated to me multiple times that the victim should be thankful of him for what he did to them. So. All right. How long has the uh, suspect been in Hernando County, as far as you can tell? Approximately one week. So, Yeah, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. if you. Um, that kind of gets us into the next thing, um, the ask. Um, this person had a criminal history um, in 2014, Riverside, California. He had domestic battery, brandishing a firearm, injury to phone lines. He's also the respondent in uh, several domestic violence injunctions from previous partners, including one that's still active. And then, of course, the current charges we have here in Hernando County include unlawful sexual activity with a minor, unlawful use of uh, two-way communication device contributing to the delinquency of a minor, um, and then uh, additionally sexual battery on our first victim, the adult, and also a no contact order which resulted in witness tampering and violation of pretrial release. And then uh, last and certainly not least, he's been charged with human trafficking. Now what does that mean? Since 1980, he has had 53, yes, 53 different residences. Um, that in our business we call a clue when you move that often and I can assure you they were not for job promotions. Uh, he was on the move constantly. Uh, that is very suspicious to us. He also has a history of uh, attempting as well as actually being successful in um, luring women and then being violent with them. So we are we don't have any necessarily specific information, but we certainly believe there could very well be other victims out there that because of this supposed contract, and of course, you can never, <clears throat> I don't think, uh, and maybe Bill Gladson could uh, uh, respond to this, but I don't think you can ever sign away your right to be raped. 
Uh, if it's against your will, it's against your will, even if you say in a contract that you're going to let a particular person do anything to you. So if there are any victims out there that uh, had contact with this individual in California, so maybe your affiliates out there uh, can uh, run some information on this. Obviously, Colorado, we're already talking to the authorities out there, but he had several residences uh, out west. And then, of course, in Florida, he, we know he has lived in uh, Miami, Hollywood, as well as Hudson, and then, of course, most recently in Spring Hill. And so if there are any other victims out there, uh, anywhere in the country, uh, we're going to uh, investigate it alongside those partners in those other areas and help it, using FDLE's assistance and maybe even the FBI to make sure that uh, every single one of victims, uh, people that he victimized, uh, get justice because uh, it, it's hard for me to believe that he, he's only had two victims in, in the last year or two, uh, especially the fact that he was on a dating site uh, attempting to get other women involved. And, and both of these women, as I said, were either naive or maybe a little bit younger than their chronicle, uh, chronological age stated. So he was certainly looking for the, ver the most vulnerable females in our society to take advantage of them. So uh, does anybody else have any questions for me or any of our other uh, individuals up here? What kind of crime could this suspect do? I'm sorry? What kind of, how long could the suspect, I don't know if the state attorney would have that answer. What kind of uh, charges in the, as far as crime served? Um, they, they're all felonies, yeah. so I, again, I, it's going to be dependent on that. But I would say uh, multiple years is 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 not outside the question. And of course, uh, again, uh, we're not necessarily assuming we're going to have actual uh, additional victims. But if there are additional victims, that will certainly uh, the court will frown upon that, and that will uh, enter into the sentencing. I'm sure. So, are both victims back with their families? I'm sorry? Are both victims back with their families? Um, I, th I think victim number two, the minor, is uh, is she back with her family or or is she getting treatment? Treatment. Treatment. I think both of them are in a safe place getting counseling and getting treatment because they are both victims of human trafficking. And it's, it's going to take a while for them to uh, uh, get them back to where they can uh, um, function appropriately in our society. So. Well, it's constant, and, and I think uh, another message that we need to get out to these young people is something that sounds exciting at first can turn that quick into something that you are, uh, words can't even describe, horrific, terrifying, uh, uncomfortable, uh, painful, you know, uh, doing things that, because uh, that's the, you know, this person was uh, violent, they might even say st sadistic. Um, and uh, it, it, things can turn on a dime. And when you're young, you don't think about those things. You just think about the excitement until you're in the middle of it. And I hope our young people and parents, because this app, again, I don't want to give them any advertisement, but I had not, and I asked with a couple of my commanders, they had not heard of this app either. Um, so there are probably hundreds of app out, apps out there, uh, famous and not so famous apps, that um, can be used for this. So. You know, parents, uh, we have to remember that as parents, we are not our children's friends. We are their parents. And no matter how much it upsets them, if we can keep them from getting involved in this, uh, it'll be well worth it when both the parents and the children look back and realize that they were going down the wrong road and the parents uh, put their foot down. And I think, frankly, most kids want boundaries despite how angry they get when you give them. So parents, I don't think you can do too much. Uh, kids will call it spying. Uh, as a parent, I consider it uh, protection. <laughs> and uh, I think you can't sta state that enough. So, all right, anything else? Uh, we're gonna get you, I think, the narrative of that contract. I think I probably read a lot of it, but there may be some more of it that might even be more uh, outrageous and, and shocking that uh, somebody would actually think to use that in their uh, criminal activity. So, anything else? Is that house that it happened at, was that, that wasn't his, or he didn't own that house? I'm sorry, was that house what? He was just renting that house? Yeah, he was moving around a lot. 
Yes, yes. He was moving around a lot. Um, so that, again, that shows, is very suspicious in our eyes. So uh, he was probably running from some things and maybe even some victims hoping if he got out of the area. Uh, again, we don't have any information on it. I want to be very clear, but if anybody recognizes this picture um, as either uh, someone who did something to them or attempted to do something, we certainly would like to make that part of the case. So uh, again, we appreciate our media partners getting this information out. And uh, if anybody has anything on this specific case, they can call uh, the sheriff's office and ask for Detective Harper. He'll be happy to uh, make it part of the investigation. Thank you all very much and have a great day. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again for being here. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And Good to see you. seriously, thank you for all your help Absolutely. on both Anytime. cases. It's been great. Thank you. I'll send the contract out to you all via media alert. That's just his booking photo. So you can grab it from our website. Could you confirm spelling on Yes, it's H O U L L I S. H O U L L I S. Actually, I don't know what his first name is. Lieutenant, do you know his first name? Is Jeffrey? James? James. James Hulis. Detective William Harper, H A R P E R. Special agent in charge with FDLE, J, initial, Scanlon, S C A N L O N. S C A N L O N, Scanlon. J, first initial. No, his first initial is J. He didn't provide his first name. He just provided an initial, J. Scanlon. And then we had uh, state attorney for the Fifth Judicial Circuit, Bill Gladson. We have an age of deal on We do. He's, I think, 56 years old. Um, I have to get the date of birth for you, or you can, if you if you get his photo on our website, then his date of birth is going to be there too. How about the specific address? That we withheld due to Marcy's law. <coughs> and he's is he um, being held without bond in jail? Or? Yes. Any other questions? Good. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. Is everybody finished with this picture? Okay. I'm just for a question. I'm sorry. Scanlon's name is two eight. I'm sorry. Scanlon is name is two eight. S C A A. S C A L A N. S C A N L A N for Scanlon. S C A N L A 